All right. All the kids. All right. Thank you, Travis and Annie. Take your Bibles this morning, Mark chapter 6, as we continue our series. And Mark, be praying for, again, so many that are traveling on this Labor Day weekend. Um, pray for Karen and I. We're heading out this afternoon. Going to go to Reading, our son's 50th birthday tonight. So we can't believe that. That makes me feel even older. <laughs> but I have to have a son that's 50. Um, but... Just pray that the Lord gives us safety and a good time over coming back tomorrow. Mark chapter 6. Again, we got a lot of folks that are traveling, a lot of folks that are out of town, but I'm so glad you're here. We're going through a series in Mark, and last week I spoke on the fact that Jesus cares. And I pointed out several things about the fact that Jesus cares. One is that um, we see his compassionate care in, when he fed the, 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 the 7,000 people, 5,000 plus men and women, or over 7,000. We see his compassionate care because the Bible says he was filled with compassion. We also see his omnipotent care in that he could do nothing. Um, he took that Five loaves and two fishes and fed over 7,000 people, and that's just not some magic trick or some, something that's a fictional story that we read about. It actually happened. Uh, it's a miracle of the Lord. And the Bible says they ate till they were filled, which simply means they had more than enough. Some of you know what it's like to be filled where you, they're actually passing seconds and thirds, and they're saying, oh, I can't, I can't eat another bite. And that's about where they were there. They were filled. They were satisfied. To the point they had 12 basketfuls left over. And so we see God's omnipotent care. And the thing I pointed out last week is that it doesn't matter what spiritual thing's going on in your life. There's not a spiritual issue in your life that God does not have the power to deal with and help you with. No matter what it is. And then we saw also his cooperative care last week. And that he used the little boy's lunch. 12, you know, to feed that many um, five loaves and two fishes, and the little boy had what he had and gave it to the Lord, and he probably looked around and said, this isn't much. My mom gave, it to, gave this to me for a lunch, but I'm going to give what I have to the Lord and uh, give it to him, and God took it and blessed it. And the point is, again, that God takes what we offer to him, and he uses it for his service, whether it's uh, great or small, uh, no matter what, what it is, God, God uses it. Um, and then Fourth was his complete care, that they were filled completely. And it's just so good to know that our life can be totally satisfied in the Lord. There's nothing lacking. When you come to Jesus and you give your life to him and you, you live for the Lord, we, there's a completeness. There's so many people are searching for things all through life, trying to find happiness, trying to find power, trying to find joy, trying to find satisfaction. And they, it comes up empty. That's what Solomon did. He went down every single road in the book of Ecclesiastes looking for satisfaction and so many things that they all ended in a, dead, in a dead end until he realized what he was looking for was God and the Lord. And people would find the same thing. He, uh, their theme song is from the Rolling Stones, I Can't Get No Satisfaction, because they just truly can't until they come to Jesus. And so last week we looked at Jesus' care completely. It his compassionate care, his omnipotent care, his cooperative care, he works with us, and his, um, his complete care. Now, this morning, we're looking at, again, another story in this passage that comes right on the heels of the fact that Jesus cares, because in this story, we find that Jesus cares as well. And also, it ties with the story that we find back in Mark chapter 4. Uh, in this story, it's the storms of life. Now, in October of 1991, a storm stronger than any in recorded history hit the coast of the Northeast and the Atlantic. And it was a storm that they made a movie of called The Perfect Storm. It was, it was called that because it was three storms that came together as one, and it caused this perfect storm, where some of the boats that, that were out there, well, the, any boats that were out there, would have encountered over 100-foot waves. 
I'm so glad we didn't encounter that. Coming back on that, that Coast Guard trip, um, we had 10 foot. I'm glad they didn't add another zero behind that one. But 100 foot where everybody in that made that movie out of it, The Perfect Storm, where everyone on the Andrea Gale uh, were killed as that ship went down in that, in that perfect storm. Well, you know what? Living here on the North Coast, we too can get some pretty good storms. I mean, the seas can get, can get pretty high, and you can get out there and, you know, the storms can, can rock you when you're out there. Um, and for those that fish off these shores or those who fish off the Atlantic uh, Ocean, uh, it can become pretty dangerous. For the people up in the Bering Sea, it can be pretty dangerous being out there in those. I get seasick sometimes just watching Bering Deadliest catch, you know. I I told somebody I told somebody on the on that ship come back. I don't know if I can watch Deadliest Catch anymore, because I'm just going to sit there on that couch and rock and roll with that boat. You know, it gets pretty pretty hairy out there. But it can be a frightening experience when you're out there on that ocean in those dangerous waters. But our text this morning in Mark chapter six is is dealing with a storm. But what I want to talk about are the the storms of life, because what they came full face with was a full force storm and, and brought real danger. There's a lot of people today who are faced with dangerous things and are grieving and they have faced tragedy. Just read the news this week uh, from the gangs in Aurora, Colorado. And the devastation that's being done there to the two brothers uh, in New Jersey, uh, two, one being an NHL hockey player, and the two brothers were just riding the bike and were hit by a drunk driver, and they were both killed the day before they were to stand up for their sister's wedding. She was got, she's supposed to got married on Friday night. They were standing up with her, and they were both were killed on Thursday. Wedding's canceled, of course. But what tragedy that family hit. The joy of having a daughter getting married on a Friday night with her brother standing up to a funeral. Tragedy. Um, to even yesterday, um, uh, 49ers uh, rookie wide receiver was in downtown San Francisco just signing autographs, and there was a robbery. And he ended up getting shot in the chest, critical condition and stable condition, but just going down to sign autographs, and here he is in the hospital having been shot in the, in the chest. Um, and what that family's grieving through. So you can just listen to the news and find the tragedy of what people go through. And, 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 and your storm may not be nothing like that. You may not have lost a loved one. You may not be in that type of tragedy or in one or one in, in the near future. But all of us can go through storms in our life, and they can come. And they can come because life's not easy. We go through storms, and sometimes we go through life, and life, and it's up and down. There's good days, and there's bad days. There's good weeks. There's bad weeks. There's good months. There's bad months. And sometimes one thing I've noticed standing out on the shoreline here is that the waves just keep on coming. Wave after wave after wave after wave. Back in when I was surfing, and Scotty would say, hey, Dad, let's go surfing. We'd go out, and he, one thing he told me, he said, Dad, don't turn your back to the wave. Whatever you do, don't turn your back to the wave, especially when your board is behind you. One of the few times I did not listen to my son, and I should have because the, I'd fallen off the board, which, which was normal. And, but the board was behind me, and the waves were coming in from behind me, and I turned around, and guess what was coming? My board, right in my face, boom. And Scotty's further out going, I told you, Dad, <laughs> don't turn your back to the waves. And, um, but those waves just keep on coming, wave after wave, and sometimes we feel like that's what our, our life is like, one after another storm after storm, sometimes within the family, sometimes within finances, sometimes within our health, our own personal life, and for sure, Satan coming after us day 
after day after day. I don't think there's a person sitting in this room that has not been tempted of Satan in some way during this past week. Sometimes, Pastor Steve, how about like every hour? Several times a day, I'm faced with this. But the storm's coming. What we're going to find here is Christ's disciples are yet in another storm. And if you remember back in Mark chapter 4, they're in a storm, only they're out in the boat, and Jesus is with them. Okay? He'd gone with them, fall, fallen asleep. Storm's coming, waves are coming, they wake them up. But here, but there Jesus was with them. Violent storm comes. But in this one, Jesus is going to come to them, and just with his voice, he calms the winds in that, in that storm. But here in our present text, Jesus comes to them in this storm, and he walks to them on water. And it's quite comforting to me because, again, in that one storm in Mark chapter 4, Jesus is with them and just says, peace be still with his voice. And in this one, Jesus walks to them while they're out there in the storm. He walks to them in the midst of the storm. And the whole point is this, is that Jesus is with us through the storm. Please write that down. Get that in your mind. Jesus is with me through the storm. Whether he comes to me, whether he was already in the boat with them, he was with them in the storm. Several points I want us to look at this morning, and the, and the first one is this, is Jesus, is Jesus ministers to the storm-tossed family of God. Look at, in verse 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethesda, while he sent them, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. So he gets the scene, makes his disciples get in the boat, go, sends the multitude away, and then he goes to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at, at rowing, for the wind was against them. And now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. Now this story takes place right after the great miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And it says in verse 45 that Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go away. And on the surface, that might seem a little strange for him to do. Rather, it would seem, had, had seemed better to make more sense to keep his disciples around and take opportunity to meet with the people that they had just ministered to and had just faced this great miracle of the feeding of 5,000 and, and, uh, and be there with them and talk with them. But remember, Jesus didn't want them or the people to focus on miracles. That's not why he came. So he tells his disciples to go. And, uh, and, and uh, in fact, the way it's written, it, it, it almost shows that they had difficulty getting into the boat and wanting to go because it says he made them in verse 45. Strong expression indicating a sense of urgency and pressing on. Perhaps the 12 were reluctant. I don't want to go. Like children. You're going to go to aunt so-and-so's, and you're going to have a good time whether you like it or not. But I don't want to get in the car. Get in the car. But I don't, want to, I don't want to come in from playing. My dad told me once, he said, I knew you were going to run track in high school because you were so fast as a kid. I said, why? He said, well, because every time he told you to come in, you started running. <laughs> You'd run all over the neighborhood. You wouldn't come home. You would, you would run away. So here Jesus corrals them, insisting that they get into the boat, almost forcing them to go out to sea. So off they go. His disciples get out there. He sends them. He sends the multitudes home, having been cared for, having been well fed, having been satisfied, having been taught. And now Jesus goes to the hills to pray, having a time of solitude with the Father. Goes off to the mountain to pray while they're going out to sea. By the way, that's a great picture of what to do after a mountaintop experience. A time when Satan loves to attack is get alone with God. When you have one of those wonderful experiences 
Go spend time with the Father and get down on your knees and make it hard for Satan to knock you down. You come to church and or any church, you go, you go and you just the blessing of the Lord, you come home, you feel revived and refreshed and you feel good. You're like, I don't want to live for you. Lord, I dedicate my life to you. Watch out. Watch out for Monday morning. Watch out for Sunday afternoon. Satan is just ready to take us off that mountaintop experience. When we are not watching, when, we get, when we're blindsided, we're, we're on the spiritual high, and we think everything's going good, and Satan's going, I'm waiting. I will be back. And he just waits for the right moment, pushes the right button, and next thing you know, you know, he's, he's attacked us. And, and we're wondering, where did that come from? And that's why after a tremendous blessing that you've had from the Lord, a good thing to do is just go get on your knees and say, God, I just want to stay here for a while. I want to come back to reality and realize you're my strength and my source and get on your knees and pray. I'm reminded of a, a story of a Swiss mountain climber named George Smith, George Adam Smith where along with this guide, he, was, he had climbed a peak on a very stormy winter day in Switzerland. And as they made their way up the side of the, of the, of the, of the mountaintop, uh, he was looking at the beauty. And when they reached the, the peak, he just he stood up and he was taking in the whole mountain and the valley below and, and forgot how strong the winds can be up there. And as a result, he, when he stood up, he almost got blown off the edge, and his guide grabbed him and pulled him down, and he said, on your knees, on your knees, he shouted. He said, you're only safe when on your knees. And I thought, how true that is. Though Christ was one with the Father, he still lived in constant prayer. And in times of crisis, he took to the mountains or the garden and to his knees in prayer. And I think we can very reverently say this morning that the safest place for, for the Lord indeed was when he was in prayer to the Father and, and he prayed. And he prayed that his mission would be accomplished and he prayed for strength and he prayed for others. And you can be assured that he prayed for these men out there on that boat knowing the storm was coming. And the safest place for you and I when we're going through storms or going through mountaintop experiences is on our knees. Very hard to get knocked over when you're on your knees and you're praying to the Father. And, and that's just a great principle, a great thing for all of us to remember is that when, when I'm going through a tough time, uh, I, need to get, I need to get on my knees before the Lord. And when I have just finished a mountaintop experience with him, I need to get alone with the Lord in prayer. So here is Jesus praying for his little band of men struggling through the storm. Look at verse 47. Now when the evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the island. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Here they were out there. Disciples, think about it. They were doing, they were sitting out on their destination, but a strong wind comes howling in, and they're struggling. Perhaps they were getting blown off course. And according to John's gospel, chapter 6, verse 19, they had, they had rowed about three to four miles. They had been struggling for about seven to eight hours. Their sails were down. The oars were out. They're, they're literally driving at the oars and yet not getting anywhere, not getting any closer, only further away. And now... They're, they aren't in any apparent danger of death in the storm, like we find back in Mark chapter 4 when the boat was about to sink and the waves were coming over, or the men on the boat with Jonah, but they were miserable. They were soaking wet. They were cold. They were straining for hours. And maybe you, you're like that. Maybe you're feeling that way. I mean, I'm just not getting anywhere. The harder I work, the further away I get. I'm just not getting in any place. And that's where these... These disciples were. But what is ironic here is that these disciples were miser in this miserable condition because, and you answer the question, they were obeying or disobeying Jesus. They were obeying Jesus. They were in this tough spot because they were obeying the Lord. What a lesson for believers. 
So much for the belief that bad things happen to you because there must be some sin or disobedience going on in your life. Yes, sometimes that happens. But here, these disciples were in total obedience to the Lord. Disobedience would have kept them on the shore. Disobedience to the Lord would have been in a warm bed, having a hot meal, dry clothes, perhaps the guest of one of the homes of people where Jesus had done this miracle, talking about about it, but, but rather it was obedience that made them so uncomfortable. It was obedience to the call that led Jim Elliott's life being taken as a missionary. It was obedience that resulted in the death of John the Baptist and Paul. It was obedience that um, caused, when I was speaking at that conference in, in, in Egypt, when those pastors from the uh, uh, Upper Nile had come, and one of the men had just had a church member beheaded because of his faith in Christ. It was obedience to the Lord. It was obedience to the Lord that Pastor Pavel's father in Russia was sent to prison for his faith, and that two of his deacons were sent to prison for their, of, his, of his father's church because of their faith. It was obedience to Christ that led to the abduction and murder of those three new tribes missionaries years ago. Listen, if you submit your life to Jesus Christ and, and, and be committed to him, uh, be obedient to him, we will expose ourselves to a, a variety of sorrows. Uh, you, you caring about being committed to biblical living will make you vulnerable to things that the uncommitted heart will not face. This passage, in fact, this passage is just the opposite of prosperity theology. Name it and claim it. Just doesn't go with this experience. Because yet if we say, I'm going to be obedient to the Lord, yes, there may be some, some contrary winds that come but there will also bring joy to your life when you live an obedient life to the Lord. Never climb a mountain. You'll never bruise your shins. You'll never get tired, never get worn out, but you'll never stand on the peak and, and, and enjoy the beauty of that mountaintop experience. Never play baseball, and you will never strike out. Don't worry about it. You don't want to strike out, don't play baseball. But you never know the thrill of hitting a home run or getting a base hit or knocking a winning run in. You never know the thrill of victory either. Don't want to get hurt playing football? Don't be running back. You will never have to go home and say, I'm hurt. I haven't pulled my hamstring since we stopped playing softball. We had a church softball league, and it seemed like every night I'd go and I'd pull a hamstring. I haven't pulled a hamstring in years. But I also have missed out on the joy of playing ball. Never obey Christ, and you will miss some of, the, some of life's contrary winds. But you'll never know the winds of the Holy Spirit in your sails, bringing you to a place of service and blessing to somebody else. Never share your faith with anybody. Never tell somebody about Jesus. Never ask someone key questions. Uh, don't ever put yourself out there. Never be forced out of your comfort zone. Never put yourself into that unwanted confrontation. Never get to the place where you feel rejected or scorned. That will happen, but you'll never know the joy of praying with somebody and seeing them come to Christ or have the, know, the knowledge of, I, I gave that person a positive witness and I, I shared a, a gospel track with them and, or I shared Jesus with them. And no, they didn't get saved right then, but somewhere down the road, um, you find out that that person came to the Lord and you know you had a part in nudging them towards the Savior. You'll never have that joy in your life. So, well, the scene here in our text then is a very beautiful and spiritual picture of, of Christ praying for his disciples. The winds are blowing out to sea. 
Christ's children are struggling in their obedience, making no progress. And again, maybe we've been there, you've been there. And when you're in that kind of situation, you can, you can second guess yourself and ask yourself, am I really, is this really what God wants me to do? Why does he, he give us these instructions? Does, does, does he really care? Why, why does God want me to do this? Doesn't God care about my life? But Mark brings our attention to this in verse 48. Look at it. In verse 48, he says that when he saw them straining at rowing, when he saw them, here the point is very clear. Jesus' focus was upon those who were undergoing difficulty. His focus was on his children that was obeying him, and they were struggling. The human tendency during the difficulties is to imagine the face of God with blind eyes. Doesn't he care? Doesn't he see what I'm going through? And I think we have all can agree that we've been there at some point where we've said, doesn't God see where I'm at? Doesn't God see what I'm going God doesn't care about me. But what we need to realize here is this, is that the followers of Christ in the storm are special objects of his omniscient, compassionate care. As you go through the storms, as you go through your life, the ups and downs of life, no matter how big they are, how light they are compared to others, whether they be health, finances, spiritual attacks, relationships, whatever they might be, Followers of Jesus Christ are his special objects of his, not just, as we said last week, his compassionate care, because he has compassion for us, and his complete care, but his omniscient care. And that ought to bring great comfort to, 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 to those of us who are experiencing difficulties, even because of being totally committed to the Lord. Verse 48. In fact, before I read that verse, sometimes we look at somebody who is, who is awesome and, and we, will, we will say to ourselves, and we look at their gifts and we see how great they are and we, we think of ourselves, man, that guy can walk on water. Or it seems like that guy can walk on water. Well, here Jesus really did walk on water. Look at verse 48. Now, about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. Jesus comes to them in the darkest part of the night, the fourth watch of the night, the darkest part of the night when they had exhausted their, all of their energies and they are in their deepest despair, Jesus comes to them. And watch, that is how he often comes to us at the darkest hour when things couldn't look any brighter so that we might learn the futility of our own strength and depend upon him. And what I need to realize this morning, and you, I want you to realize, is that the very waves that distressed them became a path for his feet. The very thing that was distressing them, and that was the water and the waves, that just, Jesus just walked on that. They just became a path for his feet. So was transcending was his power. I, I think, Ron, I think it was your son that made the, the comment to me. He said, or he made the comment where, think about it. One of the most precious things that we have in our life is gold. And heaven is paved with gold. And Jesus walks on the gold. He said, we're going to walk on the gold. The most precious thing to us is gold, but yet that's what heaven, that's what we're going to walk on. Here, here in this passage, the, the things that were depressing them and discouraging them were the seas, was the water. It was troubling them. And he, all that was for Jesus was he walked on it. He not only sees but enters the human struggle. What we struggle with, he uses as a platform to meet our need. That's something. You're out there and you're going, Oh, man, these waves are coming in. The boat's going to sink. And here, oh, no, Jesus, don't come. It's too dangerous. Don't come out. You know, that's what I would be saying to somebody. If I'm out in the boat and I see them on the shore, hey, I'll come to you. No, don't come. Are you nuts? You're going to sink. 
What's, prob- what's distressing you is not a problem to me, God says. And he just walks on it. And he walks to them. He enters the human struggle. He sees your need and mine. He said, it's not a problem to me. I'll use that as a path to, to help you out. Well, I want you to see what the response was of these storm-tossed believers and what the response was to God. Look in verse 49. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried. For they all saw him and were troubled, but immediately he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. The disciples were in abject terror. In fact, it says they cried out. Literally, they cried up. They were, some were screaming. Perhaps some might have, have been fighting the urge to jump o- overboard into the water. They were so scared. The question, obviously, is why didn't they recognize Jesus? I mean, they had just been with him. The Bible says they saw him walking on the sea. They supposed it was a ghost. Why didn't they recognize him? Well, I'll tell you why. Probably one of the reasons is because they were not expecting to see him. Maybe they weren't expecting to see him. I don't know how many times I've been in the store wearing a ball cap and said hi to somebody and they just walk on by. And I think, well, how rude. But then they see me another aisle older and I go, Pastor Steve. I didn't, ex- I, I, I didn't recognize you in a ball cap. I said, I know, I'm out of, I'm out of clothing. <laughs> you know, and then I didn't recognize you. Well, you know what else? They weren't expecting it. Now, if, they, if somebody said, hey, Pastor Steve is one aisle over, they had to recognize me right away. But they weren't expecting me, and they weren't expecting me in, in, in a ball cap. They were maybe not expecting Jesus to be out there. Like many folks, we see God at work in other people's lives, but we really don't think he will come to our aid. Well, I know he's working for them, but I really don't think he'll help me. I think he'll, he will help others, but he's unaware of my situation. I know he's able, yes, but I don't think he will really help me. They didn't recognize him, thought he was a ghost. They didn't realize who he was. They didn't. They weren't expecting him. But our heads should be cleared as these disciples were when, they, when we hear the words as they heard the words and he said to them, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be what? Afraid. In fact, folks, 365 times in the Bible it refers to fear not. 365 times. I've, I've said when God... If God says something one time, one time, it's truth. That's all he's got to say it. Sometimes we as a parent will say, if I t- I, all I have to do is tell you once. And we end up having to tell him 10, 12 times. If, if God says it one time in his word, it's truth. But listen, when he says something more than one time, you better pay attention to it. And when he says something and refers to something 365 times, Fear not. We better pay attention to it. Fear not. And the opposite of that, then, what is their response? What was their first response? Their response was one word, faith. Faith. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, this is the same story in Matthew's gospel. You have the story of then Peter walking on water. It's not covered in this this passage. Peter walking on water by faith, and, he, and yes, he took his eyes off of the Lord, and yes, he began to sink. He, God lifted him up and asked for another message, but at least he got out of the boat, and he got out of the boat by what? Faith. When we see Christ come and meet us in our troubles, listen, it causes us to grow stronger, and it should cause us to climb out of the boat of safety and comfort and then walk with him by what? Faith. So their response to him, first of all, was when they saw him, yes, there was that fear to begin with, but there was faith when they realized it was him. And when when we realize God is there in my life and that God has compassion on me and God has omnipotent care over me and God has complete care over me and God will never leave me nor forsake me, 
it should, it should cause faith in our life to say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. And yet that's so hard for us. Look at Mark verse 51. Then he went up to the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. But most importantly, Matthew also, in Matthew's gospel, he tells us what the second thing they did. Not only did they respond by faith, but also in Matthew 14, 32, 33, it says this, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and what? Worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. They ascribed to him his proper title, their lives were turned towards him in a deeper commitment, and they simply did this. They worshiped him. So first of all, what was the response of these disciples when they were out there in a storm and Jesus comes to them and he's with them in the storm? First of all, they met it with faith. Second, they worshiped the Lord. Listen, there will be, there will be plenty of ups and downs in our life. Amen? Maybe some of you are going through some ups and downs this week. There will be plenty of storms. There will be danger and difficulty and, and weariness and exposure and anxiety and sadness and all these things that come to us because we're human beings and we live. But God wants us to live with a, with a faithful heart, and he doesn't want us to live in fear. That great song, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Live by faith. And take, take great heart to the fact that Christ sees all and he knows all, and when we, he knows when we are feeling alone, he knows when we fear that no one's around and nobody cares, and it's while we are in the midst of the darkness and in the midst of the storm, he comes to us in that midst and treads across the problems that afflict us, and he says, that's not a problem for me. What's troubling you is not going to trouble me. What is going to swamp you is not going to swamp me. And he treads across that to bring us to a place of victory and a place of cheer. But he wants us to respond with faith and say, yes, Lord, I believe it. I'm trusting you. I'll live for you. And now I worship you. And I give you your due praise. Because it wasn't me. It was you. Just like I told you the story last week when... when uh, when, when Gideon's men faced the Midianites and, you know, God took them down to just 300, 300, 300 soldiers from 32,000 down to 300. There was no way that they were going to tell their grandchildren and great-grandchildren years later what a great thing we did. And it's what a great thing God did. And when God brings you through and God helps you, let that build your faith. Build your faith. And then worship him. And worship him isn't just singing the songs. Worshiping him is with our heart, our mind, all that is within me. Give praise to God. All God's people said, amen. Let's pray together. Father, we love you today. We thank you for your love and care. Lord, we thank you for this great story that you give to us in Scripture. Back-to-back stories on the fact that you care. And I pray that we would, we would trust you and live for you. We ask it in your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come wait upon you for our tithes and offerings this morning. I want to make a few announcements today um, as they come.